And this time around, we're going to be taking a look at what's called the New Republic. This time period spans right after the Constitution, so this particular video lecture is going to be looking at the period from about 1783 up until 1800. And this, to me, is a really exciting time period for American history. Why? Well, here's why. Um, this is the time period where things are really being sort of ironed out in American history. It's not really clear where this new republic is going, and in many ways this new republic could have really collapsed in on itself. So what's the reason for that? Well, there are two reasons that I would give for that. Um, one has to do with American identity. It has to do with, you know, at this time period, how do Americans identify themselves as Americans, not just as members of their local colonies or now what are called states. The second big reason has to do with political factions. So this is really important. These are not political parties, they're political factions. Factions were basically loosely organized people around common beliefs, common interests. At this time period, we have two of them. The first faction are the Federalists. The Federalists believe in a strong, centralized government that's going to guide the American nation, guide the American economy, and they believe in industry in the long term. The second political faction are the Democratic Republicans. The Democratic Republicans used to be the Anti-Federalists during the Constitutional Convention. They've accepted the Constitutional Framework now, but they want to push as much power to the local states as possible. They also believe in an agricultural economy. Why? Because they believe that agriculture is more local and it allows farmers to be empowered. Now, that probably sounds like, go, that's awesome, go team, here we are, right? Power to the people. But remember that this is also the group that favors African slavery as well. So a big part of their empowerment at the local level is to try to empower people to hold on to their slaves. Now, at the same time, America is expanding west, and because of that, they're going to lead into foreign policy issues, and that's going to be important for both Spain and France. So the overall sort of like thesis that I want you to get across uh, during this particular time period as far as this video lecture is, is that America is going through an issue at this time period of identity, and that identity is in the context of foreign policy issues dealing with France and Spain that are really going to challenge where these two factions are going to go. Okay, so let's start off then with the foreign policy issue because it really is the context for this, and that's the French Revolution. The French Revolution has two phases to it. The first phase is known as the constitutional phase. The second phase is known as the radical phase. Now, at the very beginning, there was a general acceptance that the French Revolution was similar to the American Revolution. It was probably a good idea, but there was a difference between the two factions. Democratic Republicans were very much on the team of go French Revolution. To them, this was about the farmer being against the monarchy. The Federalists were a little bit more cautious. They argued that what they saw going on in the French Revolution sounded a little too idealistic, didn't fit in with human nature, and could easily descend into chaos. So the first phase of the French Revolution was the constitutional phase. This was when the middle class in France formed a new parliament called the National Assembly. They called for checks and balances against the king, and they were also calling for what they called the Declaration on the Rights of Man. Probably sounds familiar to the Declaration of Independence. That quickly descended into the second phase, or what is known as the Radical or Jacobin phase. That's the one most of us remember as being the time when nobles were taken out and their heads were chopped off. The king is eventually killed. There is the creation of what we have in America, a republic, in which the king has gotten rid of. But the difference was in America, the king was gotten rid of symbolically. In France, the king is literally gotten rid of by having his head cut off. Well, this is where the Federalists really get worried. They take a look at this and say, hey, this is what we feared was going to happen. You had a constitutional phase, but that led into this chaotic phase in which France is really not just trying to create a new republic, they're trying to create a whole new world in which everybody's equal. And George Washington really feared that this kind of radical democracy was going to undermine order and stability. So during this time, we do have the split in the second phase in America, the Federalists versus the Democratic Republicans. Uh, Democratic Republicans, who are really symbolized in leadership by, the Je by Jefferson and the Jeffersonians, they want to support the French. And they point back to the fact that during the American Revolution, we had a treaty with France called the Franco-American Alliance. The French came to our support. That led to our ability to get rid of our connection to the king. We need to uphold this alliance then and uphold France and make sure that they too can get rid of their monarchy. Washington points to this and says, yeah, we made that Franco-American alliance, 
when there was a king and when things were not chaotic. France is no longer what they used to be. France is now this radical democracy. That alliance does not hold anymore. When Washington leaves office after his second term, he gives a very famous farewell address in which he makes an argument called the Neutrality Proclamation. He says, look, America is a young country. We do not have a lot of ability to defend ourselves. It's okay for us to have short-term alliances with countries that can uphold our interests. We do not want long-term alliances with countries that can drag us into their fights. So why, you know, why is Washington doing this? Well, what Washington's really saying is he's saying, we're gonna leave the Franco-American alliance, which is what we eventually do. And I'll get to that in just a little bit. The Jeffersonians are not happy about this. In fact, they start forming a lot of secret societies in which they meet and talk about how they might be able to organize to defend the French. Now that's gonna become very important because these secret societies, while they really weren't radical and while they weren't rebellious, they were more sort of like chatting societies. At the same time, that puts forth the image that the Jeffersonians are fomenting rebellion against the Federalists. Well, in the midst of all of this, there's a French citizen who comes over to America called Citizen Genet. And Citizen Genet goes straight to the farmers and starts appealing to them for Americans to join in the French Revolution. Well, Citizen Genet is eventually captured. Uh, Washington and his crew basically kick him out of the country. Um, he does eventually end up remaining in the country, he just doesn't do anything as far as the French Revolution goes. But what it demonstrates is that Washington and the Federalists see this as sort of a French invasion or infection into the country in order to get us to join up with this radical farming revolution. Now eventually the French Revolution kind of dies off and as we know at the very end it descends into chaos and the guy who kind of saves it, in quotes, is Napoleon. Napoleon rises to power and becomes a dictator or monarch in France. Oftentimes Napoleon is given sort of a bad rap. Napoleon actually did a lot uh, as he went out and conquered countries to spread enlightenment ideals. For example, he spread throughout Europe separation of church and state. He spread a lot of the ideals about basic human rights. But Napoleon did go around conquering places. And eventually what he did was he conquered pretty much all of Western Europe and placed many of his relatives on the thrones of those countries. The one country he couldn't conquer was England because it's an island. And so he eventually formed this sort of like trade alliance which excluded Britain um, from being able to participate in it. And that led to a war between Britain and France. Now, how does that affect America? Well, the Caribbean at the time has both British and French interests in it. And so Britain and France are fighting in the Caribbean and the French call in America and say, look, Franco-American Alliance, right? You are supposed to help us out. And so they call on the Americans to join in this. Well, the Federalists initially claim neutrality off of this and say they are not going to get involved in this war. So that's really important in order to understand the context for how America at the time period is dealing with this foreign policy problem with France. At the very same time, to make this complicated, America is also dealing with the foreign policy of Spain. So Spain on the west coast had been taking all their missions and they had been consolidating their lands and they were now expanding out on the west coast. America got kind of afraid of this. We've got France on the one hand pressuring us in the Caribbean, Spain on the west coast coming out from that area. So America forms a treaty with Spain called the Pinckney Treaty. In this Pinckney Treaty, they're able to open up trade relationships with Spain and New Orleans. And that kind of settles down some of the controversy that, that's happening with Spain. So that's good for America, except we're gonna have even more foreign policy problems. So now we got France in the Caribbean, Spain on the West Coast, and up in the North, Native Americans are getting upset at the fact that American American settlers are starting to move out into the Ohio River Valley. Native Americans form a confederacy in the Ohio River Valley, and that included the Shawnee, the Delaware, and the Iroquois, and they're led by a Native American leader called Little Turtle. And they fight against these uh, settlers in the Ohio River Valley and finally comes to a head at a battle called the Battle of Fallen Timbers. The Battle of Fallen Timbers, the Americans win, and they are going to create a treaty called the Treaty of Greenville, uh, in which the Native Americans relinquish their land claims in the Ohio River Valley because they have lost out on this area. I think what's important about this is that this demonstrates that Americans are expanding out westwards. 
This is going to lead to a long-term battle, which the Americans are fighting the Native Americans uh, for all these lands. Eventually, the United States is going to win on these issues and push the Native Americans further and further out. There's kind of a pattern that takes place where the uh, American settlers move out to an area, they demand that area, and the Americans fight back, they lose, and then there's some kind of claim, this is the last time we're going to do this to them. Uh, we continue to do it throughout this time period. So that's the context. All of these foreign policy issues, the French Revolution, French Caribbean, Spain coming in through the West, Native Americans in the North, and in the midst of all of this, in the midst of all of this then, the issue still comes up how to deal with France. And this is where we're going to kind of come to a head on the Federalists versus the Democratic Republicans. And it takes place when Washington leaves office. So when Washington leaves office, there is an election. John Adams is going to win this election against Thomas Jefferson. So the Adams presidency is immediately thrown into crisis because of what's going on in the Caribbean. And it's called the Quasi-War. Okay, why, why is it called the Quasi-War? The reason why is because America never declares war against France. But there are U.S. merchant ships that are being seized in that area. And there, there are fights that take place between U.S. ships and French ships. So in the midst of all this, Adams decides, he sends out the Secretary of State, John Jay, to go secretly to Britain and to tell them that we want to form a secret trade treaty with them. By doing that, we basically have said that we are leaving the Franco-American alliance. So now we've shifted our alliances based upon Washington's idea of neutrality. We are no longer in a long-term alliance with France. We are now in a trade alliance with Great Britain, the country we just rebelled against, and got French support to do so. You can imagine the French are not too happy. So Adams, John Adams sends out um, some ambassadors to France in order to try to solve the problems that are taking place. So these ambassadors are going to meet with the French Foreign Minister Talleyrand. But before they do, when they go to France, they come into contact with Talleyrand's ambass emissaries. And all we know about them is that we call them the X, Y, and Z emissaries. We don't know who they were, that we just call them X, Y, and Z. And these emissaries come to the U.S. ambassador and tell them, look, in order to see Talleyrand, you have to pay a bribe in order to see him. Now, this was actually common in, in Europe. In order to make a deal, you had to pay a bribe to meet with the foreign minister. Problem is, America is standing on this idea of, you know, we are different. Our identity is different from Europe. We are not going to pay, pay some bribe to old, corrupt Europe. Well, Adams is in a tough spot here. On the one hand, the American Revolution, the ideals, the ideals of the farmers are we do not pay bribes. We don't interact with this corruption of Europe. On the other hand, there is the practical side of European politics. And we are not strong enough to deal with the French. And at the time, there was a good possibility. The French were leading up to the possibility that they were going to get their army and invade America. America started to raise its own professional army. But probably, if that had actually come to a head, uh, America was not going to win against a major army like the French. So in the midst of all this in 1798, as anger against the French are kind of rising, in 1798, the Federalists win a huge election in the congressional election of 1798. And when they do, now they want to start cracking down on the problem internally, especially with these Jeffersonian secret societies that they fear are fomenting revolution against the Federalists and to overturn where the country has been going. So the Federalists passed several acts. The act known as the Alien, Sedition, and Naturalization Acts. So the Alien Act basically said we deport any dangerous people within the country. Sedition Act said we're going to stop people from lying in newspapers. The Naturalization Act says we're going to raise citizenship from 5 to 14 years. So you have to be 14 years in the country before you become a citizen. Okay, all sounds really good, right? I mean, who would be against deporting dangerous people in the country? Who would be against stopping lying? And why would we be against raising citizenship to show loyalty? Except let's put this in the context of what's happening at this time. Who do they mean when they say deport dangerous people? Well, they said, you know, French people are coming into the country who are trying to raise problems in the country. Well, there aren't like a ton of French people coming into the country at this time. So what are they really saying here? Well, people start to assume maybe the Federalists are saying anybody who's a part of these Jeffersonian societies who they consider to be dangerous now, all of a sudden, they have the power to get rid of them, right? What about with sedition? Well, it sounds good, stop lying in newspapers, but what accounts for lying? What if I'm just criticizing 
the Federalists. And in fact, this happens. There are actually cases in which Democratic Republicans who are criticizing Federalists are going to be put in prison at this time. So who determines what a lie is? And then with naturalization, think about this for just a minute. Why are we raising citizenship? Well, we're raising citizenship. That means that we're making it harder for people immigrating into the country to become citizens, right? Well, who would be coming into the country? Well, not wealthy people. They don't no reason to leave their countries. And it wouldn't be industrialists because those guys have industries back at home to deal with. The only people who are really coming into the country would be farmers who are poor, who are looking for more land. And which faction do they tend to go to? Yeah, I think you know where I'm going here. They go to Democratic Republicans. So what's the political interest in passing something like the Naturalization Act? Reduce the amount of farmers, reduce the amount of people who are going to support Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans. So you can imagine Jeffersonians and Democratic Republicans, these are the guys who fought in the American Revolution, who feared centralized power, they feared the monarch, right? They're now seeing this as like the Federalists are returning back to the system. And, you know, from our perspective today, we look at that and say, well, that's kind of crazy. America never went towards a monarchy. But I want you to view it from the perspective of people living at that time. We just rebelled against a monarch. We had these Federalists who claim that, you know, you got it. You got to give power to the natural aristocracy, right? Sounds to me, if I was a farmer at that time, like they're headed back towards the monarchy. And we got to stop them from doing that. And so Jefferson and James Madison come together and they form something called the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. They form a new principle called the principle of nullification. Their argument is states entered into the constitutional contract. Therefore, states can leave the constitutional contract. Meaning if the federal government passes a law that states feel goes over the boundaries of the constitution, they should be able to nullify it. Now, probably sounds really cool on the surface, right? Sounds good, bad law, we should be able to nullify it. So here's the problem. Who's deciding what should be nullified? Well, local state, right? But what if a local state has its own interest that it just wants to leave the country over? Now, I know you might be saying, well, but what's the big deal? Because this principle is going to become very important for the Civil War. Think about all the states that seceded in 1860. They're going to hearken back to this principle. They're going to say, we have the right to nullification. So this actually is really important and very controversial. Okay, the resolution to all of this is the election of 1800. In the election of 1800, Jefferson wins the presidency. The Congress dramatically shifts to the Jeffersonian uh, Democratic Republicans. Okay, the country peacefully hands over power from the Federalists to the Democratic Republicans. And right before that, unfortunately for John Adams, John Adams did some secret deals with France that ended American uh, alliance with France, American need to be in the Caribbean, and basically solved the entire problem. The problem is he did it all secretly. Nobody knew he was doing this. And so Jefferson gets elected. The Democratic Republicans sweep into Congress. And now we have an entirely different political context that actually is going to remain this way all, to, all the way to 1860. So from here on out, the Jeffersonians are going to be in power. Okay, I hope this helped out in understanding the new republic and the beginnings of some of our major conflicts. I'll see you in class.